Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Seem Lund and today we do another Instagram Q&A. If you want to ask me a question, then uh, follow me on Instagram at Seem Lund and I'm doing those Q&As regularly there. All right, first question. What time do you usually train? So uh, over the past years, it has changed uh, slightly. I used to work out uh, around 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. But nowadays I tend to actually work out around like 1 p.m. 2 p.m. So I've uh, shifted it a little bit slightly earlier because I've also started to eat a bit uh, earlier as well. I finish uh, eating around 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, whereas in the past it was like 7 p.m. So yeah, it's just like a two-hour shift backward to or towards earlier. I haven't noticed any like huge uh, difference in terms of you know obviously how I train, but uh, yeah, it's just uh, like a deliberate choice that I've made. I've never like really worked out the first thing in the morning. Uh, I don't like feel like doing that and I definitely don't work out late in the evening. Do you want to slow down aging? If you do, I'm looking for a few more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then send me an email to info at and I'll send you all the details. Why does coffee reduce absorption of minerals, creatine, etc.? So, uh, with the minerals is probably just the phytic acid in the coffee that uh, can bind to certain minerals. Uh, in some cases, it's good. <laughs> like, I think it's good to bind to some of the iron that you eat uh, with coffee because, you know, excess iron is very problematic, especially for men and, uh, but not, not necessarily for women. So it depends on the situation. But overall, I think it's good to bind to some iron, for example. And, uh, in some cases, like to excess like calories as well. If you eat like a high calorie meal, then it's good that the coffee can bind to some of the calories or like make you, you know, increase your metabolic rate, first of all, but also excrete some of the calories. When it comes to creatine, then uh, yeah, it is, you know, for many years, it has been taught that uh, caffeine and creatine don't go well together, that uh, you don't absorb creatine if you uh, mix it with caffeine. Um, now the evidence is a bit more like uh, two-sided or it's uh, like apparently it doesn't really matter that much uh, but yeah like certain minerals for sure that uh, coffee makes you excrete probably from the phytic acid and the caffeine can also play in some part probably is heart disease reversible uh, well depends on the severity of, of heart disease and uh, you know if we had a heart attack already uh, or some other like uh, event stroke or something so um, you know I always I do believe that you know almost every medical condition can be reversible unless it is uh, like some very late stage cancer or something like that then you probably have to like just do damage control but even then like damage control is still better than uh you know giving up and uh you know going kind of yielding to the condition i think it's always worthwhile to um you know put as much effort in and uh to uh you know make sure that you are doing everything you can in terms of your lifestyle and the diet that you can do that with a heart disease then yeah there's i think you know, obviously there's many medications now that you can use, even like statins and things like that have probably saved a lot more people uh, from that, uh, even if they have started to take the statins after an event. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, condition, there's like situations where it is very much possible. Obviously it's preventable. Like I think the m main message is that it's preventable. Like if you don't have heart disease right now, then, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't get it in the future, but it definitely means that you can prevent it for sure. Uh, hi Seem, I'm currently reducing carbs in my diet. What side effects should I expect? So usually when you are restricting carbs and going on keto, then uh, the biggest side effect is just the water weight loss. You excrete a lot more water because you hold on to less water because of the lack of insulin. Uh, you may also experience like brain fog and lethargy and fatigue from the keto flu if it is your first time doing that. So yeah, there's no like real negative side effects besides that you may like lose strength at gym you may be more tired, you may lose water weight, and uh, the other side effects could also be that you feel like less hungry. That usually can happen. Tried everything but not able to lose fat. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this obviously is very common by a lot of people to claim that, you know, they tried everything, etc. And in a few, very, uh, very few uh, cases, it is, it is true that they have literally, you know, tried everything and nothing seems to work. And in that case, they're has occurred some like metabolic adaptation that has reduced their basal metabolic rate and um, you know caused this plateau uh, but in most of the cases it usually has to do with the individual not really you know doing things right or not knowing if they're doing something wrong uh, so if you're not really tracking all your calories if you're not really yet yeah, 
pretty much weighing all the food and measuring everything and you know uh, looking at exactly what you eat then in those cases you don't really know if you are doing everything correctly if you haven't done that because uh, literally there are studies that people think they're eating like you know 500 calories less but in reality they're actually eating 500 calories more so uh, there is a huge discrepancy between people you know thinking how many calories they're eating and how much calories they're actually eating if you weigh all the food that you eat then you actually see whoa you know this 500 calories of i don't know some dish it looks it looks actually a lot smaller than uh, you think it is so like let's say ice cream like a bowl of ice cream that's almost like you know 800 calories like a, this much uh, but you think that it's only like you know 300 or 500 for example so this is an example that you know people who don't you know, do dieting for a living or who don't weigh their food exactly, they don't really know how many calories they're eating. Of course, you don't have to do that to lose weight. But if uh, you are, you know, clueless or you're kind of hitting a plateau and you don't know what's going on, then the first thing to do is to actually yeah, just weigh everything um, and uh, to measure everything, count all the calories and uh, also just follow like a good uh, plan in terms of a diet plan that enables you to stick to a calorie deficit and it also incorporates aspects of resistance training cardio for sure if you're not doing cardio then obviously you need to do the cardio um, and uh, making sure that you sleep is well check your hormones just in case maybe you have low testosterone um, that or, or low thyroid that definitely slows down the weight loss can we use glycine for hair fall so glycine is definitely useful for hair growth uh, by supporting collagen turnover it's not, it's not like, you know, a miracle for hair growth, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it uh, at least has like a benefit. Does glycine have side effects? So uh, I haven't seen any like legitimate side effects. Um, you know, there's the studies that, that they take 90 grams of glycine a day and there's no side effects from that. Some people have commented that uh, if, if you have like histamine intolerance or SIBO, then you shouldn't take glycine or that glycine is harmful in that scenario. Uh, I personally haven't seen any like actual like evidence to prove that it happens. Uh, so um, right now I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm going to say that uh, there is no, or I, I haven't seen at least like any uh, real uh, scientific side effects to glycine. Uh, some individuals can get like hypoglycemia from taking too much glycine so they get like tired or they get a headache or something like that but the reason for that is that the glycine kind of lowers your blood sugar too much which causes this hypoglycemic response but those are pretty much the only things that i i know next question coffee versus bone broth for a morning drink so um you know it depends when immediately after waking up i wouldn't recommend drinking coffee because your natural cortisol rise is already you know elevated and uh, taking the caffeine at that point would make you crash and uh, can also make you like dependent off the caffeine to get energized bone broth is a good drink in the morning i think uh, personally i don't i wouldn't like to drink bone broth because it can be a bit like too heavy uh, immediately after waking up i would just you know drink water and maybe some minerals mineral water something like that after waking up uh, the bone broth is definitely good before your first meal um so yeah I mean, but it's not like a bad thing to drink in the morning if you like it uh, personally i would you know drink water immediately after waking up and then like one to two hours after waking up i'll drink coffee and if i were to drink bone broth then i would drink it before my first meal or just like as a snack in the middle middle of the day ideal breakfast i think an ideal breakfast obviously just has to have protein and uh, fiber that would satiate you for longer and prevent like this big ups and downs in the blood sugar so like eggs and a little bit of uh, salad or vegetables i think is you know traditional breakfast but definitely very very suitable and optimal as well in a lot of ways i wouldn't like to eat like very very heavy things in the in the morning uh, personally and i definitely wouldn't recommend eating like a lot of carbs either for breakfast should your hands be warm when fasting daily 16 and 8 <laughs> um you know if your hands are cold during the fasting window then it probably means that yeah like there's less blood flow there and um, that can be from like low thyroid or just yeah you know being in a calorie restriction in that time frame so obviously you don't need to have your hands warm if you're doing fasting um, but it could be a sign that yeah like you're just either restricting your calories too much or not eating enough food and uh, over time it could cause like some retinopathy 
or not retinopathy, sorry, but uh, you know neuropathy, so that uh, over time that coolness and lack of blood flow can damage the fingers as well and could lead to like some permanent damage. Um, but um, yeah, I would much rather focus on the you know calorie intake and the fasting window. Mm, how is the NMN subject going? Uh, I believe this refers to the NMN ban by the FDA. I haven't heard any news from that, but I think that they're still like just investigating and seeing what they're going to do with the NMN eventually. How to deal with oxalate overload? So uh, oxalate usually comes if you're eating like, you know, a lot of raw, these uh, oxalate rich foods like raw beetroot or a lot of raw spinach on raw kale and those kind of things. If you're just eating like a normal diet and you cook your food and you cook your vegetables, then chances are you don't have any problems with oxalates. Only like a few individuals who uh, yeah, are predisposed to it uh, can mostly experience these uh, side effects. And uh, you know, to break down oxalate, you need calcium and uh, vitamin C. So you just make sure that you also eat like a you know, good balanced diet. That's kind of the key to this. Um, I have a presentation about vitamin D at uni. Any tips? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, depends on the class or what depends on the, present, the style of the presentation. But, you know, I would just include uh, the not only like the vitamin D, but also like the sunlight benefits. Obviously, I think that's kind of overlooked. Not only is the vitamin D important, but sunlight also has all these other benefits that we need to take into account, like the uh, UV radiation, melatonin, NAD and circadian rhythms, all those things. How do you have your coffee? Is it bad to have milk in it? Uh, so I usually have my coffee like black and maybe like a little bit of like one teaspoon of milk or something uh, just to make it a bit less. It's not like white coffee, it's like beige coffee <laughs> at that point. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's not bad to have some milk in it. Uh, I don't think that there's any issues with that. I mean, you lose some calcium with coffee as well and uh, you get some calcium from milk. So it makes sense. Um, what time of the what uh, which time do you start your day how is a normal day look like uh, usually i start my day like on average i wake up at like 6 a.m and uh, at some times i'll wake up at 5 a.m as well the latest i'll wake up is like 6 30 or 7 but uh usually it's like yeah just 6 or a bit before 6 a.m and my day usually yeah just looks a lot about you know this uh, work that I'm doing, content creation, writing books, emails, whatever, uh, you know, things I'm doing related to the YouTube channel and uh, my overall like business, then uh, I'll definitely like work out as well. Some form of physical activity, saunas, uh, walking, uh, spending time with my wife and, uh, you know, eating dinner. That's kind of, <laughs> that's the general average a day, what it looks like. If I do carb cycling in four days, do I need to supplement vitamin C every day or just on the carb day? Uh, so interesting, I don't know if you would need to supplement vitamin C if you're eating carbs. There's no like inherent uh, reason for that because I mean, carbohydrates usually have vitamin C in it already. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think that there's need to take the vitamin C. I personally take vitamin C only before my exercise and if I take the collagen with it. So, uh, you know, the best time to take vitamin C is uh, before exercise and with collagen because it helps to support the collagen uh, synthesis and the collagen turnover. Can glycine be supplemented in subjects with hypothyroidism? Uh, I don't see a reason why not. I mean, uh, you know, glycine doesn't have any like antithyroid effects. It uh, helps with inflammation, helps with blood sugar levels, and uh, you know, it definitely like lowers your body temperature slightly. But uh, I don't think that's an inherent reason, although like hypothyroid individuals may have lower body temperature, uh, it's not going to make the condition worse. And uh, it definitely helps with like collagen turnover and things like that, this, you know, it helps with the skin turnover, which is something that can also suffer if you have hypothyroidism. Which supplements to take before a fasted workout? So it depends on the goals and the type of workout. If you're doing like lifting, lifting and resistance training, then I would suggest to take like, you know, some of these amino acids or some protein or HMB or maybe like citrulline, beta alanine or something like, you know, this that help to uh, have a better workout. Uh, those are generally, you know, better to take 
even if you're fasted, because uh, working out fasted just uh, in most cases isn't the you know, most optimal for at least like muscle growth. If you're working out for like cardio, then you don't inherently need to take any supplements. Um, yeah, that's kind of my 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 philosophy about it. But uh, I do prefer to still take some protein even before cardio because you know you're less catabolic if you're doing cardio and you can you push yourself uh, more by doing that. So if you are you know doing cardio in a faster state, then uh, it's like you know you're burning a lot of muscle. Uh, especially if you're, if you're starting to go like anaerobic, if you're doing like anaerobic cardio in a fasted state, then that's pretty catabolic and kind of harmful for the muscle maintenance. But if you have like some protein before even the high intensity cardio, then that kind of prevents that. Why is, why my face is often bigger bloated, even though I work out and look fit? <laughs> so, uh, that depends, you know, you might have just a bit more extra body fat. So the uh, face is one of the last places you start to lose the fat from. So, uh, you know, you probably need to be a lot leaner than you think you are. And, uh, you know, there's things like sleep affects that. If you're sleep deprived, that's harmful, you know, or if you are uh, eating too many carbs, you have insulin resistance or yeah, just holding too much water weight in the face by eating too many carbs or having too high insulin levels. But that's part of the things that I would look at like inflammation, you know, can also affect that, but that the inflammation usually comes from the insulin resistance or not sleeping enough. Next question, does 10 to 20 grams of hydrolyzed collagen powder plus 2 to 3 grams of vitamin C, is it enough? Uh, or it has, or it has to be collagen peptides. So the hydrolyzed collagen powder is collagen peptides, generally, uh, they mean the same thing. So the, the difference between them is just like a marketing thing. The collagen peptides sounds fancier, but they're generally they're the same thing, the hydrolyzed collagen and the collagen peptides. Uh, two to three grams of vitamin C is uh, more than enough. <laughs> so even, even like 80 milligrams of vitamin C is enough to start the collagen synthesis. So you don't need any more than like 100 milligrams of vitamin C. And I wouldn't take like two to three grams of vitamin C. That's a bit too much in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I would just take 100 milligrams of vitamin C and uh, 20, 20 grams of collagen, maybe 10 is enough already. Another question by the same uh, individual. Uh, if it's okay with 20 grams of collagen powder, should I split the dose or can I take the 20 grams in one sitting? So yeah, like either in two doses of the 20 grams or one dose. I think uh, 20 grams is fine to take in one dose uh, there's an, or in one sitting. There's no um, harmful effects to that. You just get a lot of collagen <laughs> precursors immediately. Best moment in the day to take vitamin C supplement. I personally think it's, yeah, like uh, either in the evening on a rest day, if you haven't exercised or before exercise on a day that you lift because that's where it uh, helps to synthesize collagen the most. Decaffeinated coffee also suppresses minerals when combined with food. Uh, yes, that, uh, I, I, think, I think it's uh, true because the decaf still has, the, you know, obviously polyphenols and phytic acid that can do that. What's your take on grounding earthing? What about grounding mats? I think uh, grounding is something to definitely consider. Some people need it more than others. Very like EMF sensitive people generally need it. Uh, I'm not EMF sensitive. I do have a grounding sheet on my bed. Um, I don't have a grounding like mat on my computer right now. But um, yeah, I mean, I do ground accidentally, <laughs> you know, at least a few a few times a day because I'm in the countryside and, uh, you know, I'm just going outside and touching the ground in some shape or form uh, as a like a environmental exposure of course it's much harder in the city in the winter but um, yeah like at least like once a day it's good to, to like you know ground yourself for maybe like even like a few minutes um, thoughts on pro metabolic diets not sure what you mean by that so i i would guess that pro metabolic diets refer to just the idea of raising a metabolic rate a lot and boosting thyroid function um, with different means, whatever it is. I think that it's, of course, important to have like a good metabolic rate. You know, a low metabolic rate increases your cholesterol, increases the risk of getting obesity, increases the risk of diabetes. Uh, but at the same time, you know, an, an excess metabolic rate can also lead to autoimmune diseases and uh, you can also just become frail and sarcopenic if you have just a too high metabolic rate. So there's obviously needs to be a balance. Um, if I were to choose, you know, which one 
would I want? Like, would I want to have like this very cold, low thyroid, <laughs> uh, skinny, low metabolic rate? Or if I want to have like a high metabolic rate that has energy and, you know, high body temperature, then I would probably choose the high metabolic rate. But, um, you know, the best is probably just, you know, like a normal <laughs> metabolic rate. How do you measure that? That's hard. But uh, yeah, you don't want to be struggling with weight loss, uh, but you don't want to be like struggling with uh, getting enough calories either. Like I think, you know, from a longevity side, then you know, excess uh, metabolic rate also, you know, causes more reactive oxygen species and uh, wears your body down through the metabolism. So it's not that uh, just a fast metabolism. Me- metabolism is always better. You do also like wear and tear the body out uh, too much if you just eat too many calories as a, as a baseline. Next question, what is the most optimal time to take the glycine and NAC combination when lifting? So yeah, glycine and NAC combo, uh, it has been found to have a positive effect on lifespan by boosting glutathione and, uh, you know, NAC and antioxidant. I think taking, yeah, the NAC before the workout in the morning is better than after the workout because that's going to, if you take it after the workout, then it's going to reduce the muscle anabolism that you get. So it's better to definitely take it before. Uh, cardio or weights first to deplete glycogen. I would definitely do weights. So you deplete the glycogen, then you're in a fat burning state more, more in a ketotic state. And then doing cardio is much more like more beneficial for obviously fat loss and the, you know, metabolic flexibility side as well. Uh, but, um, do you think oil pulling is worth the claims? So, uh, I think oil pulling, so yeah, like you swish around oil, like olive oil or coconut oil in your mouth to like remove bacteria and what are like other things. I think you don't, wouldn't need it if you have like a good dental routine. I think oil pulling probably works in terms of having these antibacterial properties. Is it necessary? Probably not if you use like a good toothpaste and a toothbrush. So uh, yeah, I don't think that it's, you know, I don't do it. I don't think that it's kind of inherently mandatory but it wouldn't like harm, it wouldn't harm you either. If you have like some bacterial problems in your mouth, then yeah, like coconut oil, oil pulling is probably good. Uh, But I wouldn't like, if you don't have any health or dental problems, then you probably don't need it either. If if you have like a good toothbrush, I wouldn't use like obviously mouthwash is going to kill the bacteria, which is also actually linked to some health problems and uh, definitely don't uh, do that. Is eating the cartilage from drumsticks good for collagen? Yes. So like, yeah, like the soft bones and the cartilage uh, and the chicken wings and those things are very good source of collagen. Uh, Thoughts on dry brushing. (laughs) So that's another like this alternative health method where you, you know, brush your skin with uh, like a brush. And uh, that also like removes dead skin cells and uh, pretty much helps with like skin, you know, anti-aging side. Uh, I haven't done that (laughs) myself either. I think that it's, you know, it probably is good in in a lot of ways. Um, I think the sauna is probably better. Like in Estonia and uh, Finland, we have like this whisks or I mean, you, like whips or, you know, these are uh, branches like a juniper, not juniper tree. That's like a bit hardcore, but, uh, you know, the birch leaves. So you have birch leaves on a stick and you like beat yourself with those. That is, I think, a bit better. <laughs> because the sauna already, you know, eliminates the dead skin cells and uh, detoxifies the skin through the sweat. And if you beat yourself with the sticks, <laughs> then uh, that also like, you know, directs more blood flow to the skin that helps with the blood flow in the skin, uh, delivery of nutrients, elimination of skin scale, skin cells. I think that's a bit more, uh, let's say, optimal and uh, much more effective probably as well than the dry brushing. But if you don't have the sauna and you don't want to whip yourself with the leaves, <laughs> then uh, yeah. You can do the dry brushing. Is it bad to soak beans or meat in soda for tenderizing? <laughs> so that's an interesting question. I think let's say, I think they mean the baking soda, for example, uh, to soak beans or meat in baking soda. I don't see a reason why you would want to do that. Um, you know, baking soda has a lot of sodium, so you definitely you would definitely like make the food a lot saltier. So you wouldn't probably need to add any extra salt. Uh, the uh, alkalinity of baking soda, so it's very alkaline. It could like reduce the acidity of the meat. I'm not sure. So that could be good, but obviously you do need acidity as well for uh, breaking down the food. Uh, so I, I think it's you know it doesn't have like any real 
negative side effects, um, but it does like reduce maybe the acidity of the food and uh, definitely adds a lot more salt to it. Do, do, do. Supplements that should ideally be taken with food. So uh, this would be mostly like this fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, K. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like I wouldn't take a lot of supplements uh, with food unless they are fat soluble and you need to have some fat with them. I prefer to take most of my supplements with like uh, in a fasted state with some water. TMG, vitamin D and spermidine take in the morning or after a meal. So I would take uh, them in the morning, probably. I mean, vitamin D, it already has like a little bit of fat in it. So that's why you probably don't need to like eat extra fats from there. Is icing your testicles for 15 minutes a day good for improving testosterone? <laughs> so uh, I think the claims that it increases testosterone, there's not enough proof to that. I think it would indirectly have a positive effect on testosterone levels. Uh, but I think the biggest impact is going to be on sperm count and sperm motility. So definitely has a positive effect on the sperm, but the tes testosterone, um, not sure exactly. I don't, I don't think it would hurt. Like you would probably still want to, you know, do it a little bit for the sperm benefits. What's the perfect protein to fat ratio for weight loss? So uh, depends on the other diet that you're eating. Let's say if you're eating like a normal diet, then I would say that for uh, protein, you want to get like for optimal weight loss or the most like effective weight loss is going to be like, you know, 40% of your calories coming from protein. So that's going to be like 100, 150, even 200 grams of protein um, for most individuals. And the fat, I would stick to like, yeah, the bare essentials, 35%. And the rest of it come from carbs. So that's kind of the most effective weight loss uh, macros, probably. 40% protein, 35% fat, and 25% uh, as uh, carbohydrates. Then if you're, uh, let's say, a bit less hardcore, you know, you're uh, eating like a less restricted diet, then, you know, 35% protein is still something that you would want to aim for, for good weight loss. And maybe 40% fat and the rest from uh, carbs. Anything less than that, I, I think any more than like 50% fat isn't needed. And it's definitely not like, it's counterproductive a little bit. And uh, anything less than 30% of protein is also uh, counterproductive for uh, weight loss. Which grain is healthiest to eat most often? So grain, uh, well, I think maybe like buckwheat probably. Buckwheat is a pretty healthy grain and it has like pretty good um, micros and minerals as well and it tastes pretty nice it has its low, low glycemic index has a lot of minerals and uh, pretty kind of satiating in my opinion hey mate you said you do omad what is a normal day of eating for you so uh right now i'm doing that yeah like before my workout i'm drinking a protein shake with some collagen um, and maybe like a piece of fruit or something then i'll work out and in the evening i'll eat yeah, like meat, vegetables, fish, uh, tubers, potatoes, those fruits again, and cottage cheese, yogurt, those kind of things. What diet would you recommend for healing after ankle surgery and is fasting a good idea? Uh, well, I would definitely maybe encourage some aspects of time machine eating because if you're like immobile and you're not moving around that much, then you're not burning that many calories either. And it's good to not get fat is to uh, is to do some time machine eating. Uh, but you also want to make sure that you pretty much supply the body with the right, right uh, nutrients to help with the healing and recovery. So you do want to have plenty of protein and collagen for that. So glycine as well there, maybe like, you know, get uh, 20 grams of collagen, even like 30 grams of collagen and uh, like 20 grams of glycine as a supplement and uh, some high protein foods as well. Exercise daily, lean, muscular, eat good, cholesterol is 277, what to do? So uh, there are like, you know, things that raise cholesterol, obviously number one is going to be saturated fat intake. So if you're eating a lot of uh, muscle meat and, uh, you know, butter and uh, saturated fats, then kind of reduce that. The second thing is to eat more fiber because the fiber will bind to that if you're living in the northern uh, you know regions of the world then and you're not getting a lot of uh, sunlight then you know vitamin d or sunlight exposure helps to convert cholesterol into cholesterol sulfate that helps with you know 
these like growth ion and uh, as well as vitamin D and just hormones overall. So if you're not getting enough sunlight, then that's an issue or that, that would be like an explanation of why the cholesterol rises. If you have low thyroid, which doesn't uh, sound likely for you, but uh, yeah, low thyroid function raises cholesterol and actually excess zinc intake also raises cholesterol by reducing copper absorption. So the zinc copper ratio determines your kind of cholesterol levels and excess zinc from too much muscle meat and not enough organ meats uh, or not enough dark chocolate or beans, uh, that also raises the uh, cholesterol levels. Thoughts on lion's mane? I think lion's mane is probably one of the best nootropics because it he directly helps with nerve, like helps with the brain cell growth and neurogenesis. Um, so yeah, definitely has a, like a very good track record for like a mental performance and cognitive function. Thoughts uh, on periodic five day fasting for health and longevity. I think five days is a bit too much. Uh, you definitely don't need to go for five days. Kind of most of the benefits plateau at uh, day three. So there's no inherent reason to go for day five. You're just gonna lose a lot more uh, lean tissue and uh, slow down your metabolic rate. So I don't, I'm not a fan of fasting for longer than three days. I think a periodic 48 hour fast is great and maybe 72 hours fast as well every once in a while. But um, a five day fast, maybe like once a year is probably fine. But I personally think that day, day three is where you already get most of the benefits and you don't really need to do these super long fasts like five or seven days if you are you know, exercising regularly and being kind of mindful about your overall diet. All right, that's it for this Q&A. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund and uh, I can ask you a question next time. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.